Okay, so um, what, what you can do to get started is go on to modules and then um, download this file it's called F16 and import that as a staff crunch, just like I showed you in the video. Um, although I kind of assume that most of you are pretty, you know, computationally savvy, um, I, I will make some real short video tutorials. I make like YouTube videos, like a minute or two, and then you can watch those uh, on some of these uh, you know, staff crunch operations. Okay. So I'll give you a minute to get started. By the way, I, I'm just going to mention this, I guess because I should. Um, so I, I like to make video recordings to class. I like it that if you have to go out or you're absent or whatever, you can go back and you can watch the videos. I also like it that you can review because quite honestly, although you know I like to get everyone's questions and everything, we, we, we do have to have a schedule, right? So sometimes you may think I'm rushing. If you do, please feel free to go back and watch the video. If anyone has an issue with it, and it's perfectly fine if you do, just let me know, okay? And, and, I'll, and I'll be more than happy not to do it if it's the next class. Right? So anything you say can and will be held against you, all right? Okay. I've never had an issue, but I just have to mention that. Okay, so what we want to do today... God interface, everyone's good. If you have questions, please come and see me. I finally got the number for the Pearson help, where they actually help you. They're, they're for the instructors. They really help you, and they're actually really good once you get that number, okay? So, and those things will happen from time to time. Okay, so what I want to do today is um, I want to talk about this thing that we call exploratory data analysis. And, and what I want to kind of impress upon you is this. I know that some people on the homework, you were looking at those problems on context. And sometimes they're very confusing. And they are. That's how real life data sets are. And the goal of this class, if I, if, I, if I can teach you one thing, okay, it's that you're mindful of what you're doing. And I can tell you, as an engineer, I, I went to an engineering school, I went to Carnegie Mellon, so I totally know how engineers are. I'm not saying it in a bad way, but very often it's kind of like a flow chart mentality. When you have this, do this. When you have this, do that. It's very useful a lot of times. And statistics is not. Statistics is, is a lot more like golf, okay? You know, when you hit a ball, in the rough, close to the green, you don't just automatically measure the distance and grab for a club, right? You kind of have in, 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 in your mind the type of clubs you're going to look at. Maybe eight iron, wedge, nine iron, right? And you go and you look at the ball. You think about where you are in the wind, and a lot of context comes into play, okay? Same thing with statistics. You have a bunch of tools you have available. Which do you know what to use? You have to think about it, okay? And that's what this course is really designed to teach you to do, is to how to think about data how to make good decisions, okay? So what we're going to do today is actually called exploratory data analysis, okay? Sometimes people abbreviate it EDA. It's in the book, but not in my notes, but it's actually quite important. And it's abbreviated EDA a lot of times, you'll see that. What, and this is how this got started. And this is kind of relevant to, to engineers and, and thinking about statistics. The history of statistics, I'll, I'll give you a one minute history of statistics. When statistics got started, the mathematicians did not respect statistics. They said it's not real math. And the statisticians, they got all butter, right? They, they, you know, they got all upset. So what did they do? Well, they tried to make it really mathematical. Put a lot of mathematical language, add a lot of theories, and you can, and you can do that. There's a, there's a branch of math called major theory. You can make it very mathematical. And then what happened was they weren't thinking about what they were doing. They were doing all sorts of stupid things. And what happened around 1960, this went on for quite some time. This started like in the late 1890s. Around, around, around 1960, there was a guy called John Tukey who came along. He was, a, he was a topologist from Princeton who became a very famous statistician. So he had standing in both worlds. He was a very well-known mathematician. He was also a well-known statistician. And he had the standing to tell statisticians, hey, don't just throw things in a computer. And by the way, this is when computers started to become really, really useful to, to, to scientists, the 50s and 60s. You can't just throw things in a computer and start computing things. You have to look at the data first. And this is actually more relevant to you than it was even back then. Because now, what are you dealing with? Big data. Where you have like a thousand variables, right? 
And what is the temptation? The temptation is to do neural networks or machine learning or some sort of high polluting um, process, right? We have no idea what's going on in that black box to give you that answer. And because it worked for Joe, Jill, and whoever else, you believe it works for you too. Maybe, maybe not. How do you, how do you visualize that many variables? I have a hard time with this three. So this is actually more relevant today, okay? So we're going to start off small with just, with just one variable and kind of work up. But this is what you want to be thinking about in the back of your mind, okay? So suppose, uh, th this is kind of what we're going to be doing. This is kind of the thinking, okay, what we're going to be doing. So suppose I wanted to describe to you what my sister looked like, okay? There's a lot of different ways I could do that, right? The one way is I could give you a table. So this is a, her, this is a picture of her face, and I digitized the image, okay? So I could tell you the intensity and the hue of every little pixel, right? And of course, that means absolutely nothing. We have no clue what she looks like. I don't know what she looks like from that, right? So what would I do? Well, I might show you a picture. Might, I might take that table of values, right, and make, and make a, a picture with it. Now you have a really good idea of what she looks like, okay? But suppose I didn't have the picture on me, or I just wanted to describe what she looked like, right? What would I do? I'd pick out the main features that we, that we look at in a person's face, and I would, I would describe what they look like, right? So, you know, I might say, okay, her skin color is this, her hair color is this, her eye color is this, you know, any other distinguishing features, okay? The thing I love about statistics is it's just like common sense. We do the same thing with a data set. We make a table, we plot the table, we describe the main features, okay? Exactly the same thing. Now, what we do depends a little on sample size. In other words, if we have a really big sample, we're gonna, we're gonna treat it differently, okay? In fact, we are gonna make a table, which we're not gonna do for small sample sizes, okay? We're gonna make different types of plots, okay? And we're also going to describe them differently. And it really has to do with the fact that with small data sets, you can't get a good picture. It's like taking a picture on my old Moto G, you know? It's, it's really fuzzy and everything, right? The other one's like if you take a picture in a Samsung, right? Very, very sharp and clear. You have more, you have more data to work with. Okay. And I'm just going to mention parenthetically, right now we're not going to look at two quantitative variables. We're going to come back to time series a little bit. Unfortunately, we're not going to do very much with those. But we are going to do um, scatter plots later on. So we're, we're going to do a lot of regression. But we're not worried about that right now. But it turns out we're going to do exactly the same thing. Those have exactly the same steps. Make a table, plot the table, describe the plot. Okay? Just different. It's just very different. So one of the things you want to think about when you're making a plot, since we're doing exploratory data analysis, right, we're looking at it and kind of seeing what we see, is you want to know what to, what to look for. So the idea, the, the main concept here is that the sample should be estimating something from the population, okay? So that means that the plot from the sample data should estimate what the plot from the population looks like. So let me kind of give you an idea of what that means. So what is this plot? So let me let me give you the context, okay? This was some white noise that I generated, all right? I subtracted off the DC frequency, and this is the distribution of frequency. So the frequency here is in the physics sense, right? This is in Hertz. And this is how this is how many times, this is the measure of how many times this frequency occurred. So a lot of the frequencies were around the DC frequency, and then the distribution kind of scales off. The, the blue is the data, and in fact, you can't see it because the red theoretical curve is supposed to be predicted through this process in this red curve. And notice that those, those blue little bars, they so closely approximate the red curve, you can barely tell that there's a difference, right? But that's what's going on. That data, those blue bars, are tracing out a curve in my mind's eye, right? That's what I'm trying to get. So what I'm thinking to myself and this is an assumption, but it's always true, is that this, this plot that I make, I should be able to fit it to some sort of nice curve. This blue, which is from my sample, should kind of fit to some nice curve. And that's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm trying to do. And it's very rare that you can't do that. Okay. So let's kind of look and see how this works for, for one quantitative variable. And what I'm going to do is I want to show you how to do this in StatCrunch first.
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that data set that I asked you guys to load up, the F16. Uh, we have it loaded. And so if you have StatCrunch, go ahead and make, make sure that you load it onto StatCrunch. If you don't, um, laptops are really helpful in the class. Just make, make sure to bring it next time or look off of someone else. Uh, let's see, I already have it loaded, actually. Uh, let's see. Okay. So this is what the data set should look like when it's loaded into StatCrunch. I have three variables, right? Year, accidents, and changes. Notice that all of the all of the plots, okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on the graph tab and a submenu will come down. Okay. And we're gonna we're gonna work with histograms, box plots, and dot plots in this class, all right? We have this, we have this uh, uh, data set. Let me see if I can kind of, for some reason, I'm not syncing here, sorry. Let me try this. Okay. All right. So if we look in that, if we look in that data file, okay, we have a bunch of, of values. What should we start to do with this? Should we start to make plots? Should we start to contribute things to that data set? What do you think? Am I ready to start plotting things? What do I have to know? You're shaking your head no. What do I have to know? Context. I have to know context, okay? Context is really important. So in this case, what am I looking at? Okay, I'm looking at the data from all the F-16 fighter jets, okay? From 1986 to 2016. They predate 1986, but there are reasons why they're not included in the data set, okay? Uh, what am I looking at? Well, I'm looking at a couple of variables. I'm looking at years, okay, the data for each year. And for each year, I'm recording the number of Class A accidents and the number of cockpit modifications. So the F-16 has been really heavily modified, okay? And we're looking, and, and, this, and this, these, these changes, and this is important to understand, the changes were the number of changes in the cockpit made to all of the F-16s in that year. So when they made a change, they made it uniformly, okay? Why? Well, it turns out they have, a, they have a really high accident rate. And Class A accidents are the really bad ones, where you total the plane, or basically the person is permanently disabled during the class. Okay? So they want to figure out, since they're, since they're modifying the, the, the F-16, they want to know, does it have some, some sort of effect? Okay. And finally, the how. Um, so this is a data set that was provided by a worldwide student. I worked with him on a thesis, and he got this information from the World Air Force. Not classified. So we have a general idea now of what we're looking at. Okay, now these things actually make sense, right? So what I want to do is I want to make a, a dot plot first. And all we're going to do with a dot plot, it's actually very easy. It's going to, it's going to be for, for one quantitative variable. So I'm going to have the scale for the quantitative variable down here. So this will be x, my, my variable. And what's going to happen is every time a value of x occurs, StatCrunch is just going to put a little dot at that value. Very low level sort of plot, okay? Now, there's, there's one little catch here. Notice that I said you should use dot plots when you have small data sets, right? So we said that we generally use a dot plot when the sample size is like 20 or less, right? It's kind of arbitrary there. But I have 30 some in my data set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the number of accidents for each level of modification. So if you go back and you look at the number of changes, if you go back to um, StatCrunch for a minute, zero to three changes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a dot plot for zero changes, a dot plot for one change, a dot plot when they made two changes that year, and then finally the dot plot for when they made three changes that year. They're going to be like stacked dot plots, OK? So here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to go to graph, uh, dot plot. 
And whenever you choose a command, then StatCrunch opens up a little sub-menu. So the first thing it says is, what variables do you want to look at? I'm going to click on accident. That will populate the right-hand column. And I'm going to group by changes. In other words, this is saying make dot plots for different values of changes, okay? And of course, you only want to do this if you have, you know, a small number of changes, right? I'm going to plot the mean and the median on there. And then we're always going to put uh, labels and titles. So really good practice when you're an engineer is when you're creating a table, you should put um, labels on the axes and the titles so that a person can look at that graph and understand what's going on. They don't have to go back to your data. They don't have to go back to your report. When you work with the military, it's super important. So I work with US um, uh, AFOSR, Air Force Office of Strategic Research for many years. And I can tell you that when you plot, when you present plots to people who are higher up, they rarely know what you're doing. They don't understand the mathematics. If you make it really technical, you bore them to death. You need a killer plot. Something that's very eye-catching, very clear, they can look at it and understand it. Although they're really good at what they do, they're really bad at technical stuff. So you need to aim it like at the level of like a high school student. What could they look at and understand what you're doing? It's kind of the same level. Okay. I'm, I'm not being facetious. This is the way it works. So this is the accidents per year. You could say accident rate if you wanted. Usually dot plots really don't have a Y label, okay? I mean, you could, you could call it frequency if I only had this one, right? But it's, you, there usually really isn't a Y label per se. But because here I'm going to stack the dot plots, I'm going to call the Y number of changes, okay? So I'm going to say um, number of cockpit modifications. And finally here I'm just going to say distribution of accident rates. Per number changes. And you may find a better way. Usually when you when you make titles and access labels, you think about it more and you say, oh, you know, I could make that a little more compact, make that a little clearer, okay? Just to kind of give you an idea though. And there we go. There are results. Okay. So let me just kind of take you through this briefly, right? So these are the accidents that occurred when there were when there were no modifications. So you can see that one year there were, there were zero accidents, right? But, uh, two years there were three, and so on. Okay. This none, this is the accident that occurred when there was one modification, two, three. What do you notice about this plot? What strikes your eye? Good or bad? So that certainly that certainly seems to be true. They didn't make any modifications. They were lower than when they were one. But what about two? Maybe not as much difference. Isn't that kind of weird? Okay. So we're gonna kind of come back to that. What else? What else strikes your eye here? And um, so you might say, well, why do you make such a piss poor plot if it doesn't communicate any information? But it kind of does. So when we get to the description, we're going to see if there's, there's kind of some, some information. But here's the idea. A lot of times when we make plots, we're doing it to really kind of explore the problem. We want to see what's going on. We might want to collect more, more data like this later on. In this case, it turns out we can't. So we might have to dig more into the data set. I'm going to go into that a little bit more. What else kind of strikes your eye? There's something when I look at this that really kind of I find very dissatisfying, kind of kind of puts me off. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't like that. What, and one of the bad things about StatCrunch, as opposed to Excel, there aren't many, is you can't really change the, the position of title. So yeah, aesthetically, I don't. I don't like that. One last thing. So we'll, Yeah. 
there's it's 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 very unsatisfying as far as what it as far as what it tells us. And I'm gonna we'll get to this description, I'll talk about that a little more. The one thing I want to point out is that when there were when there were three modifications, how many accidents were there? Okay, there was there was there, well, well there was only one year where there were three modifications. I'm gonna say that too much, okay? So that's really not giving us any information. One data point doesn't tell us very much. So what might I want to do? I might want to group two and three together, okay? I never I never throw away data. You're losing information, but I might want to kind of group it with, with two, okay? Especially since it's kind of in the middle of where two, the two data points are, the data points for two modifications, okay? So let, let's kind of explore this a little bit more, all right? Okay, so we know how to make it. So what is it that we want to, we want to kind of describe, okay? So a couple of things that we want is we want to describe usually the range of values, okay? We want to kind of talk about how the points are distributed. Are they even? Are they clustered? Okay. Uh, we might want to talk about where the where the center is, and it turns out that those two things are actually kind of related. And they're evenly distributed. This the quote unquote we haven't talked about it yet. The center of distribution will kind of be in the geometric center. Is the point. So here, for example, if I just look at, at no modifications, I might say project with no modifications. The number of accidents range from zero to about 14. They appear somewhat evenly distributed, and they're centered around eight, which is where they're moving. But the reason why I made this plot was I didn't want to just talk about that. I wanted to talk about the the, the relationship between these different distributions for the different levels of changes, right? So what 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 I might say is now I want to compare and contrast. So I might say zero to two look kind of similar. They have roughly the same center and roughly the same spread. I haven't talked about what those things mean, but just intuitively you understand what I'm saying, right? But for the one level of modification, it does look different, doesn't it? It looks like this distribution has been shifted and there's more variability, right? So to kind of go back to, uh, what is the name of it? Right, so that's, I'm sorry, Justin. Justin, thanks, okay. So what Justin was saying is actually kind of true. Why is this unsatisfying? It's unsatisfying to me. Why does that kind of surprise you? What do you think? I mean, you have to make sense of this, right? You're, you're, you're given this data set. Your boss says, make, make sense of this. This student actually wrote this thesis to try to inform the Air Force about, about the cockpit modification. What would you conclude just based on the data? We're not, we're not proving anything, but what, what might you think from this data? Okay. Right. Take your stuff. Uh, Anything in, in how? Tell me how. Why is it inconclusive? What makes you draw that conclusion? Then you have to come up with it, right? But there's something about this. I missed that answer. So looking at it like this, it looks like there's really no difference between those two modifications. So why bother adjusting the number of changes stuff when this actually has no impact on the number of accidents per year? So the one thing that I would conclude from this data is something similar, which is it's very it's very counterintuitive. It looks like zero and two modifications kind of yield similar accident rates, and somehow one is yielding more. And that makes no sense, at least not to me, right? Did you have something, Justin, you wanted to add uh, on? I'll just say that. Yeah. So what would we have to do? Well, we have to dig deeper into the data. This is where context comes into play. Okay. I would want to know what type of modification. Was there a learning curve? Maybe they made two modifications one year, but there was a learning curve. And it wasn't until a year where they made, made, made one modification where it really kicked in. Where there, where there, are, where there are correlations, does the modifications kind of accumulate? Does the effect accumulate? There's a lot of things that have to look into. That's why this is not plug and shut. And it turned out in the end, we're, we're going to analyze. Well, actually, I won't. I won't, I won't tell you. I hate. I hate spoilers. Okay. But see, this kind of gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. But this is one of the reasons why people say, you know, statistics has a bad, a bad rap. Like it doesn't prove anything. Well, we don't. You never prove anything anyhow, but you can't you can't figure out anything. You can't 
can, but sometimes the answer is a lot more complicated than you might might want. We have to, we have to dig a little bit deeper. Okay. So, any questions on dot plots or that particular, or any comments that you have? So, I want to go on to histograms. Histograms are things that you've seen before. So, I'm going to kind of fly over somewhat quickly how this is done. So, these are the accidents in the peach, okay, from the data set. And the idea is that we don't really care, for example, whether there are 10 accidents or 11 accidents. Those two numbers, you know, there's not a big difference, right? So, we want to kind of group them together. We want to get that nice curve, right? If we plot these things individually, we're going to get a bunch of little bars and they're not going to really tell us. So I'm going to group this in, in bin width of five. We group them in, in human bin. So from zero to four, there were six. Notice that we're, we have to be careful with the endpoints. Okay, so that curve bracket means the five's not included in the first interval, right? Um, so there were six between zero and four. There were ten years where we had five to nine accidents and so on. So what have I done? I've taken the data. I've made a table, right? What am I going to do? Plot that table. Okay. And that's, and that's going to be the, the histogram, right, right there. And then we're going to see how we describe that plot. So let's see how this works in um, StatCrunch, okay? So here's the idea. We go to histograms. So let's, 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 let's go back for a second. Let's try to go back for a second. Histograms, same sort of setup, okay? I'm going to choose my variable accidents. And there's a, there's a couple of options that are kind of useful here. So when it comes to frequencies, there's different ways that we can we can talk about how many are in each bin, right? So I can I can I can talk about the absolute number in each bin. I can talk about the frequency. And the frequency is just the counts, right? So in that first bin, I have a frequency of six, okay? What is the problem with frequency, though? Well, frequency is relative to how many are in your population, okay? So I have six in this bin, but if I would have made my population 10 times larger, I have 60, right? So it isn't actually the number we're interested in. It's usually the, the relative frequency, which is called the proportion. So the relative frequency is equal to the frequency divided by the sample size. Okay. We call this in statistics a proportion. We're going to use this word throughout the entire semester. This is called a proportion. It's telling you the fraction of values that are in that bit or in that interval, right? And the last one is, is the percentage, which is just 100% times the relative frequency, right? Um, I abbreviate a lot, so if you have questions, that's just relative frequency. That's how we abbreviate it, okay? And this is what we tend to use. And we're going to see in Chapter 3, this goes by a highfalutin name. We call this the probability density function. So you don't have to write this down right now, but this is called the probability density function. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to work with the, the uh, relative frequencies. When we do analysis, we're interested in proportions. Okay? So I'm, I'm not going to click um, relative, I'm not going to click frequency, I'm going to click relative frequency. I'm going to put value over the bar. When you hover over the bar, it'll tell you the interval you're looking at, and it'll tell you the proportion. I'm sorry if I'm in the way there, okay. And um, I'm gonna put the mean and the median in. We haven't talked about them yet, but we're gonna find out they're useful. And just put the label, so it'll be the same sort of thing, right? Accidents per year. And now this will be the, the uh, relative frequency. Now I can just say distribution of F16 class A accidents. Okay. 
something like that. And now you go ahead and say compute. All right. And there we are. So notice it gives me the proportions, which I like. I like being able to see that. As, unless you have a calibrated eyeball, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell exactly what those percentages are. So if it's 19% of my values, 19% um, of the years, there were zero to four accidents. 32% of the years, there were five to one. So, okay. Is that a, is that a good plot, a bad plot? What do you think? Good? What, what do you think? Uh, it's a good plot. Why? What are we What are we looking for? What is your eye trying to do? Bring across the y column. Right. I'm I'm asking myself. Can I, in my mind, draw a nice smooth curve for that? Because I think I can. Okay. It kind of looks like this. A little hump, and then it's kind of coming down to the cape. Okay. So I'm I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Now sometimes you won't get that. Okay. So when you don't, you have you have to play around. Let me show you how to do that because on your projects, this, this will come in handy. I go up to edit and I can change the bin width. So suppose I said, you know what? And this is kind of an important rule about, about histograms. With histograms, we need a minimum of five bins, minimum. And minimum is really bare minimum. We like, we like at least six, and we're gonna see for theoretical reasons why, okay? We like at least six bits. So I might say, you know what, let's make them a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna start at zero, and I'm gonna make a width of three. And notice I, I didn't really improve things. And notice I, I changed the, the, the appearance a lot. Now it looks like there might be a curve that has two humps. Okay. So you have to be careful when you plot. But I, in my mind, I can fit this less to a nice curve than when I have a width of five. So I'm going to leave it what it was before. Okay. There is, by the way, if 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 you like mathematical stuff, there is actually a rule for figuring out what the bin width is going to be. There are two statisticians, Diaconis, first side Diaconis. And Michael Friedman. And there's a thing called the Diaconis Friedman rule. And what this does is this estimates the optimal bin width. It's not a hard um, formula, but I'm not going to give it in class. It's kind of like extra for experts. If you like mathematical stuff and theoretical stuff, you can look that up. It's kind of interesting. And to some degree, that's what StatCrunch is doing. It uses a variation of that rule, OK? It's a cool rule, but it's a little complicated, so we won't, we won't deal with it. Usually what we do is we just do eyeball. We look at it. Should I make it? Does it look too coarse? OK. You might try a little finer bin. If it breaks it up too much, you can't get it much better. Then you just go back to what you had. All right. So what do we want to describe on a histogram? This is, a, this is an important slide. So now we've got to the point where we made the table, we plotted the picture, and now we want to describe it. You're in the elevator with your boss. You say, hey, I gave you that accident on the data. What does it look like? Well, you don't go, well, one year there was no accident. You know, in two years, it keeps losing more time. Okay. Same thing. We want to kind of describe the main features. So here's what, here's what we describe. We talk about the number of local peaks we see. We're going to talk about its shape where the center is, whether we have outliers, and what the width is. We're going to look at each of these separately, okay? okay. So the first thing is the number of modes. And I'm going to actually list these, because this, this is an important part of this class. This is sometimes what we call descriptive statistics, okay? We're, 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 we're describing what we see. So. These are the important features of a histogram. So first of all, the number of modes. And we think of a mode as, as kind of like 
a local maximum in calculus, okay? So if we have no modes, in other words, there's no one value that really sticks out, okay? We say it's uniform. Uniform in the sense that everyone has roughly the same likelihood of occurring, okay? So if you look at um, the probability that you're gonna roll uh, a particular number on a die, they're all kind of uniform, right? If we have one hump, this is what we usually have, unimodal, unicycle, right? One, unimodal. <coughs> Two humps, bimodal, two modes, like I6, right? So unicycle, bicycle. More than two, we just say multimodal. That happens very rarely. So let me ask you a question. Why is this unimodal and not and not bimodal? One that I'm claiming is unimodal. Aren't there two local maximums? Shouldn't that be bimodal? What do you think? It's only separated by one value that's fairly below that second local maximum. Yeah, and so you might interpret that. You might say, I think that's really part of this curve, but there's a little blip, right? Maybe this bar is underrepresented, this bar is overrepresented, or both. So there's a difference between blips and modes. And sometimes they're hard to distinguish, okay? So we're, 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 we're going to assume in this case we only have one mode and that other one's a blip. But it can be difficult. For example, um, I'll show you. I'll show you an example where it's not so obvious. So, this is the this is a histogram, okay, of all of, of all professional golfers. For every professional golfer who played at the tour that year, they took their average drive. And they plotted all the average drives. Okay? So someone averaged two twenty two twenty five, and someone had an average drive of three twenty. Awesome. Um, why do you think I have two modes? Is that significant? There's definitely two modes, right? Definitely bimodal. Yeah. Female and female? There is. I didn't say who they were. There's LPGA and PGA, women and men. Okay. So why are the number of modes important? Because often they represent subpopulations. I definitely want to know that. I can't compare those two drives, right? They're from totally different populations, okay? So sometimes you can get situations, especially where you have two different populations. If you look at height, for example, of men and women, they used to be very well separated. Now women are getting a lot taller. And so here's what's happening with the heights. The women look like this, the guys look like this. When you combine them, it kind of looks like, depending on how many data values you have, it kind of looks like a shoulder. You see this a lot in engineering, this, these, this kind of signature, okay? Then you have to decide, and of course you don't get this, right? Because you get a choppy histogram. Then you have to decide, is this really a blip on a shoulder, or is this really a different population? Okay, so sometimes it's, it's not so obvious. Okay, questions on modes? Everybody's good? All right. Okay. So next we wanna talk about outliers. Outliers are probably, I think, the hardest thing for people to deal with, okay? And an outlier is very much like it names, like its name sounds like. An outlier is kind of like an outcast, right? So here's all the nice data values playing together, and this this poor data value is like an outcast. You know, he's an outcast. He lies outside of the value, right? So visually, they're very easy to pick up. But the question is, what are they, and what do you do with them? And what people are always tempted to do is just throw it out. The reality is that outliers are sometimes the most important part of the, of the data set. So there are a lot of engineers that do finance. If you do finance, everything is really centered, centered around outliers. And if you want to read a really great book, this is a really, really interesting book to read. This is called The Black Swan. And I can't remember the author's name. He's, um, he's a Russian. He made a fortune. He was an engineer. Started off as an engineer, made a fortune in financial markets because he realized that the outliers are actually the important things in financial markets. So to throw out outliers is really bad, very, very bad practice. Okay, anyhow, that's just a, a fun book to read. So why, why are outliers important? Because what you want to know is, is this person in your population with just an extreme value? Or does it represent a different population? So you may, for example, when you're doing engineering, very often you're doing, you're doing fabrication. When people do low, low uh, temperature superconductivity, they play around with stuff, they mix stuff. 
You may find that these are like, you know, um, annealing temperatures or something like that. And you may get one batch shot here. That may be the really interesting batch. Maybe the company is in business. You messed up and made a mistake. But this, this big batch is becomes significant. It's just not like the rest. And how you make that distinction, again, there's no nice formula for that, okay? And here's the reason why. So this happens a lot in engineering. When you're looking at lifetimes, especially, this is the lifetime of soap bubbles. Um, some, uh, I think it was a Paul Molo, I think my data was out from a long time ago. Paul Molo uh, was doing some research and they wanted to make this soap bubble that last for a long time. So, so this is a distribution. But lifetimes tend to have very, very long tails, okay? And so what's happening is you don't have enough values to fill out this tail. These are not outliers. They're outliers in a technical sense, but they're not outliers in a practical sense. I'm definitely not going to fill them out. What might I do? I might want to collect more data, okay? But I wouldn't assume that these are the center of the population. All right? So it always becomes kind of a tricky point of how, of how you deal with this. And again, why? Because in my mind's eye, I can draw this curve and convince myself that these probably lie in the tail of that So a lot of distributions are very, very skewed. Not just in engineering and finance, too, these things occur. Okay? Okay, so the last thing I want to really talk about today is shape. And again, we tend to keep things very, very simple in statistics, okay? We either say that a distribution is symmetric, meaning that it has mirror symmetry, right? There's a line that I can cut to the data set, and I can kind of pull the data set back on itself and look at the mirror image, right? Or it can have a tail. And the code word for tail in statistics is skew. That's how we say tail, all right, in statistics speak. And what we comment on is what side the tail is on. So this has a tail, but it's on the left side. We say it's left skew, the left tail. This has a tail on the right side, right tail, the right skew. Sometimes people use the word positively skewed and negatively skewed. That means the tail's on the, on the positive side. It's right skewed, OK? I'm not going to use that, but you'll see that a lot. Why do we care about shape? We're going to see that it's really important to how we uh, define the, the, the center and the spread of the data set. Okay. So what we've, what we've done now is we've talked about the number of modes. Uh, we've talked about outliers. Talked about shape. I haven't really convinced you why shape is important, but I will in the, in the next section. So any questions on these things right here? I'll make one last comment about outliers. Outliers are, without a doubt, one of the hardest things to deal with. And we're going to keep talking about them over and over again because they're things that engineers wrestle with. Sometimes it's genuinely hard to figure out, especially if you look at a data set that don't have context. And later on, I'll show you a, 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 a data set where we're looking at the number of home runs that Major League Baseball hitters hit back in 1922. How many people are not familiar with Babe Ruth? Does everyone know who Babe Ruth is? Show of hands, does anyone not know? Do you know or not know? Okay, everyone everyone knows. Okay. In 1922, Babe Ruth hit five times more home runs than anyone else. So everyone else is way down here, and Babe Ruth is way up there. So what do you assume? Is Babe Ruth an alien? Is he from a different population? No. But it's very tempting looking at the data. It really looks like he's definitely different. It turns out five years later, everybody's doing what he did. There are a lot of people hitting 50 home runs. But when he first came on the scene, he was really kind of like the edge of some new sort of trend. So sometimes figuring out whether an outlier is legitimate or not and what to do with it is kind of tricky. Okay? But here we can't throw him out. He's part of the population. He's just an exceptional person. Okay, so I want to go now and talk a little bit about center. And I'll, I just want to end by going back to our, our example. Okay, So if we look at the F-16s, right, how would we describe it? We'd say that there's one node that's unimodal. It looks like it's right skewed. It looks like there's a, it looks like there's a hump here, a shoulder, and then it's going down. And we'd say that there's no apparent outliers. Okay. So that part's pretty straightforward, right? Okay. So the last thing we want to talk about today, and we're not going to get fully through this, is what we call the center of a, a data set. We're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about measures of dispersion and measures of central tendency. Okay. So a measure of central tendency is kind of measuring where the center of the data set is. We're going to see that's not as nice as clear cut as we might like. 
And there's two different ways that we can do that measurement. We can compute the mean, also called the average, okay? Some people, when they want to be really careful, call it the arithmetic average, because we have geometric averages and different types of averages, okay? Or the median. And so some questions come up. It's like the old saying, a guy that has two watches can never tell what time it is, right? When you have two measures of central tendency, which do you use? And so we're gonna, we're gonna discuss that. How do we compute them? What does that mean? When do we use each of these? And what are issues that kind of affect them? Okay. So let's go over to, to um, StatCrunch and see how to, how to compute these first, okay? Um, the only thing I wanna just mention to you and I, I'm sure that everyone has seen this, so kind of bear with me. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Is that very often we're going to want to compute general sums. And by general sums, I just mean that I want to compute a sum, a finite sum, but I'm not going to specify how many are in there, right? So n is my sample size. So if I'm looking at some variable, the way I might think about this is I might label each variable x1, x sub n, right? And I'm just going to think about this sum. I'm going to sum the first data value, the second, on to the nth data value. And I'm sure all of you have seen this notation, right? And calculate this mean or something. It just says sum the x values from x1 to xn. Okay. So just a really quick refresher. And we'll have some math refreshers as, as we go on, all right? So the one thing I want to talk about before we get into computation is we have different types of means. So which mean do we mean? This becomes really important because when we're doing a study, what are we trying to get when we're looking at a quantitative variable? We're trying to get the mean from the whole population, right? Can we get that? Very rarely, right? The population is too big. So first of all, we talk about this thing called the population mean. And this is the symbol. It looks like a U, but it has a tail. It's the big letters for mu. Okay. So this is the mean of everybody in the population, which I can't get normally, right? Population's too big. Now, one thing to kind of bear in mind is, is notation, okay? So mu is a very important symbol. It's reserved for population mean. Capital N tends to be reserved for population size. We're not going to use it for anything other than that, okay? Those are like uh, reserved symbols, kind of like in a programming language, right? Certain words are reserved. But here's the important thing. It's a parameter. What does that mean? To say that mu is a parameter. Does that make any sense? What do you think? So what are what are parameters? It varies. I'm sorry? It varies. No, the opposite. Fixed. Fixed. Because what is it? It's the value from the entire population, right? It's some number that characterizes a property in the, in the population the population mean. So this is a fixed number, but we can't get it. Very rarely we can get a population mean. So what do we do? You have a chance to redeem yourself. What do we do? Give up? <laughs> so for example, if I want the average height of everyone here at Embry-Riddle, can I actually get that number? It exists, right? And I, I was an omniscient being. But I don't know if you conceived of all that data in the first Exactly. And that's kind of the problem. Why can't I get everyone? Because I'd have to be able to find everyone. They would have to consent, right? And this is actually not so big a population. So even just finding there might be a real problem. Does that answer your question now? Maybe not? To say that we can't find any data doesn't justify saying that finding it is simply a challenge. Okay. okay, so, so, so here's the idea. I want to know what the average height of all Embry-Riddle aeronautical students are. If I'm an omniscient being, I could give you that number right now. It exists, right? So I could get every single person in Embry-Riddle and line them all up. There's actually a real number, right? That's the population mean. That's what I want. But I can't get it because I can't do that, right? I can't force people to do things, okay? That's why we say we can't get the population mean. But what can we do? We don't give up. What do we do? Take a sample, right? The sample estimates this unknown number that I want. Does that make sense? Okay. Use a proportionally small sample. Well, this is not a sample. This is this is everyone, right? 
But I'm going to try to take a little piece that looks like the population, and from that sample, I'm going to get the sample mean. Okay. All right, we're going to pick up. Go ahead and read through the notes. They're on. Um, they're on Canvas, and we'll pick up from here on Friday. All right, thanks. And I will post the recording of the video also online, so if you want to go over that too. Talking too loud for you guys. <laughs> okay, some people have sensitive ears. I don't want to hurt anyone. Sorry, that rush over here from the other side of the building. Um, can I sign in or do I? No, it should be. Is, did I? Um, you know what? I did not. It's up there. And that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I thought I did. Yeah, you want to sign that. That's, that's, fine. that's fine. That's cool. Thank you. I'll try not to be uh, out of that class as soon as I can. Okay, that's all right. We're all, we're all, we're all on a learning curve. That's, that's cool.